Three non-Japanese experts are being asked to provide advice on the decommissioning of reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. It's been nearly three years since the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami caused multiple nuclear meltdowns. The International Research Institute for Nuclear Decommissioning was set up last year to support the government in dismantling the crippled reactors. It's comprised of utilities including Tokyo Electric Power Company, the operator of Fukushima Daiichi, as well as makers of nuclear plant equipment. The organization has been soliciting technological assistance in Japan and abroad. The three foreign advisors include Louis Echavari, the Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Echavari says a transparent decommissioning process should be drawn up along with a clear financial plan. It's better to have a multi-year budget because research and development of technology takes a long time. So it's very difficult to manage that if you have a very limited budget just for one year. Under the present plan, removing nuclear fuel debris from the reactors will start as early as in the first half of 2020. How that will be done is yet to be decided. That's because not much is known about the exact state of the damaged fuel that will require sophisticated technologies to remove. A nuclear industry organization held a recruiting event in Tokyo on Sunday. Nuclear-related organizations have been suffering from a shortage of applicants since the accident at Fukushima Daiichi in March 2011. Students who will graduate in the spring of 2015 gathered for the event featuring 22 companies and organizations. They included utility firms and reactor manufacturers. I study decontamination, so I would like a job in a related field. I also want to contribute to the process of shutting down Fukushima Daiichi. I felt so powerless when the accident occurred. I hope my university studies will be useful in helping Fukushima to recover. The annual event is held in Tokyo and Osaka. It attracted 420 people. This is slightly more than 388 who came last year, but is only one-fifth of the number before the Fukushima nuclear accident. Some companies are visiting universities around the country to recruit students. Whatever the future of nuclear power will be, we need young people with strong ambition. I hope such people will decide to work for us. Hattori says a key issue is whether the industry can show young people it has an appealing future. Now live from London is Professor Chris Busby, Scientific Se Secretary of the European Committee on Radiation Risk and a member of the UK Department of Health Committee examining radiation risk for internal emitters, or C-E-R-R-I-E. -E. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Professor Busby. Um, how dangerous is the current radiation level of 7.8 millisieverts for humans? Well, if it were caused by the explanation that TEPCO have given, then it would not be. It would not, in my opinion, represent a very great, great hazard. But I, I don't believe their explanation. I've done calculations myself, which show that it's almost impossible for uh, this kind of dose to to occur within a reasonable distance, about 10 meters from the from the radioactive tanks on the basis of the fact that there's strontium-90 inside the tanks. So what I think the 7.8 millisieverts represents is it represents measurements 
that are uh, of beta radiation and gamma radiation coming from material that's already outside the tanks and that is basically in the ground. And this is very, very dangerous because it, it actually represents a contamination of the ground of about 250 kilobecquerels per square meter. That's once 250,000 disintegrations per second per square meter. And that comes from material that can be inhaled after resuspension or it can get into people in various other ways. So that, that represents a, a very serious hazard. Right. Now, according to the operator's uh, report, the radiation levels at Fukushima were eight times higher than norm back in August. And isn't it strange that the authorities of Japan have only now uh, urged the company to take measures? Well, uh, the, this whole procedure has, has, uh, has been um, dogged by arguments between various people in government and various people in the nuclear industry and so on. So I imagine that this is just a consequence of a lot of arguments between various sides of the uh, of the of the issue. You know, the nuclear um, industry people and the government people. You know, it's eventually well, the government people have won, or somebody has won this, and that's why it's taken so long for, for for some remark like this to be made. I mean, I would guess it's entirely political. This does not has to do with the reality. Right. Do, but do you think that TEPCO's cleanup activities are effective enough? I mean, are they doing enough right now? I don't think there's much more they can do, to be honest. I think the thing is out of control, and I, I can't see what they can do. I mean, what they've done, basically what, what we have here, in my, in my opinion, many others too, is that um, the, the core material from, from the reactors is outside of the containment and in the ground. And so then the, the water, the groundwater is then picking up this radioactivity and bringing it to the surface. And, of course, they're taking as much of the groundwater as they can, this contaminated groundwater, and pumping it into tanks to store it. But until they actually address the basic problem of the stuff being outside the, the containment, then, then there's not much that they can do. They can sort of certainly attempt to clean up the stuff that's in the tanks. That in itself would be quite a complicated business. But as for the stuff that's outside the tanks in the ground, I'm not sure I can see any way in which they can deal with that. Right. Now, other than being in the ground, I think that the Japanese have admitted to releasing 400 metric tons of water into the Pacific Ocean, I think, on a daily basis since the, uh, you know, since the tsunami and the, the, uh, the whole situation occurred. Uh, and, I mean, that's three years at 400 metric tons. Uh, have you heard that? In, is that... Does that coincide with figures that you have uh, for... Um, yes, yes. Uh, and also, of course, there's the amount of material that, that went, blew, blew out to sea and ended up in the Pacific right at the beginning. And so this is, this is an ongoing problem. So you have an enormous amount of radioactivity in the Pacific from the beginning, and then an ongoing very large quantity, probably about the same amount eventually, um, being, pumped, being, being poured out into the Pacific all the time. And this is, in fact, affecting the Pacific biota. I mean, there, there's lots of evidence now that there's a crash a complete crash in, in the life life forms in the Pacific. We're, we're seeing lots and lots of evidence for this, and it's really, really quite terrifying that, that this is having an effect on Pacific life. So, and, of so, course, that Pacific mm -hmm. life, you know, is is, uh, is is the source of food for a very large number of people in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Can we talk about the risks? I mean, who exactly is at risk? Uh, where does the risk come from? I mean, if we talk about starting from Japan and going out to the the Pacific Ocean and people who consume the fish that are in the sea, who, how many people are at risk, really? Well, most of the risk is, in my opinion, com confined to, to Japan. Um, the concentrations of radionuclides by the time they uh, that, that go into the Pacific or have been have been injected into the Pacific, by the time they get to the United States and to China and to Southeast South Korea and so on or Korea, um, will will not be enormously high. I mean, I'm not saying that it's great. You know, there will be some risk to to, to these people, and particularly the risk is from the ingestion and uh, of of radionuclide particles, and not so much from the from the dilute stuff, from the stuff that's in solution. But the main risk will be to the people of Japan, and, and uh, they will. It will be people who live who live along the coastline of eastern Japan who will be greatly at risk within about one kilometre from the sea. And I, I, I did did some calculations which suggest that just in terms of cancer, there will probably be about four hundred to eight hundred thousand extra cancers in Japan in, in in the next in the next fifty years as a consequence of this. It will be absolutely measurable. I mean, the nuclear industry is saying it can't be measured over the background rate, but it will be certainly measurable. And we've already seen some effects in infant mortality, and we've seen some effects in, in thyroid cancer already in Japan. And so I think this is just going to get worse. We're going to see a, a, a major effect on the general health of the Japanese population 
in 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 northern Japan, uh, it's going to be quite measurable. There's going to be a decrease in the birth rate and an increase in the death rate. Well, you don't feel that there's a, a risk to people who are dependent on food from from this the Pacific, because obviously this is going to. I mean, if we talk about the food chain and uh, the way that uh, uh, the contamination actually. Uh, becomes more concentrated as the smaller fish, yes, yes, you know, right, as the smaller fish are being eaten by the larger yes. fish that live for quite some time, and you end up with a tuna that's not only full of mercury but as well uh, has is also radioactive. Uh, I mean, should we be concerned as consumers about buying fish uh, from those I places? I think people will generally uh, uh, stop stop buying fish from the Pacific. I, I, I actually I don't think that the risk is as much as people have thought in terms of, of fish, because we have studied people who eat fish from the Irish Sea and from the Baltic Sea, which is very highly contaminated following Chernobyl and from the Wythens Test Ballo. So we roughly know what's going on there. The point about these radionuclides, when you ingest them, they go into the gut, and, and a large proportion of the really serious ones, the plutoniums and the uranium, don't get across the gut. The main source of danger is from inhalation of sea spray and inhalation of resuspended sediment. That's the, because, of course, once they get into the lung, then they don't have this barrier that they have in the gut. It goes straight into mm -hmm. the lymphatic system. Japan's former Prime Minister Yoshido Mori will lead the team preparing for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. He accepted a request to head the soon-to-be-established organizing committee. Hakubun Shimomura is the government minister in charge of the 2020 Games. He told reporters on Sunday that Mori accepted the post when they met in Tokyo. Shimomura told Mori he's best qualified for the job because of his global network of sports and business contacts. He said the former prime minister can also enlist support throughout Japan. Mori became prime minister in 2000 and served in the post for one year. He once was the chairman of the Japan Sports Association and is the current chairman of the Japan Rugby Football Union. Howdy peoples, I'm Abby Martin and this is Breaking the Set. So it's no secret that the U.S. military has over 5,000 nuclear warheads, enough to eliminate most life on Earth. But it may surprise you how much it costs just to maintain these weapons. Well, a new study from the Center for Nonproliferation Studies just concluded that over the course of the next 30 years, the U.S. will spend nearly $1 trillion to either keep these weapons operational or modernize them. Because you know the Cold War never really ended. And if there's one thing we need to be spending billions of dollars on, it's mass killing machines. So while this country continues to lag behind in education, income equality, and sustainable energy, at least we can keep the people of the world up at night knowing that the Cold War is alive and well, and we got our nukes locked and loaded.